Today, today's Power Pivot focus is on rebounding from COVID, Memphis travel and tourism. The COVID-19 pandemic forced many businesses to rapidly change how they do business. The society's first responsibility during the pandemic was to eliminate opportunities to spread the virus. The, uh, the corona pandemic delivered a lingering and possibly permanent hit to business travel that is likely to weigh on employment and economic growth in some communities for years to come. The job losses have already been severe. About 1 million travel related jobs have been lost according to the Labor Department, including more than 600,000 hotel positions and 120,000 airline and related staff. Also cut were thousands of positions in fields ranging from restaurants to aerospace manufacturing to convention center operations. Today, our guests will discuss the impact of COVID-19 on the hospitality and tourism industry in, in Memphis and Shelby County. Our guests are Ted Town, we'll start with Ted Townsend, who serves as the Chief Economic Development Officer for the Greater Memphis Chamber in partnership with the University of Memphis, where he is also the Chief Economic Development and Government Relations Officer. Ted serves in a joint, over, joint role overseeing and aligning both organizations' efforts to attract and grow businesses in the Greater Memphis region. Our next guest is Nicole Seltzer. Nicole is a director of sales at Memphis Renaissance Convention Center, which was formerly the Cook Convention Center. She has been in the hospitality industry for more than 20 years. Nicole is a graduate from the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. In 2004, she came home to Tennessee, transferring to the Memphis Marriott downtown as a senior sales manager. She has spent over 10 years in the Marriott International uh, business. Uh, before moving into her current role, Nicole also spent some time as a national sales manager at the historic Peabody Memphis. Our next guest is Kevin Kern. Kevin is the vice president of public relations for Memphis Tourism. He heads the global team's media outreach initiatives and serves as the proud ambassador for the home of blues, soul and rock and roll. Prior to joining the Memphis Tourism communications team in May of 2017, he served as a director of public relations for Elvis Presley Enterprises and Grayson for more than 12 years, where he worked with numerous media outlets along with film and television projects that focus on King of Rock and Roll and his famous Memphis mansion. Welcome to Power Pivot and thank you very much for coming on the show today to share with our viewers what's going on in the travel, tourism and convention industries during the COVID pandemic. Uh, we will start with a presentation from Kevin Kern and Nicole Seltzer. Then we will have a presentation by Ted Townsend. Um, so Kevin and Nicole, you can start your presentation. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Kevin Kern with Memphis Tourism, uh, Vice President of Public Relations. We're so glad everybody could join us today. As we talk about uh, tourism, we know what happened in the last year. It's been a difficult year, and uh, we're going to try to look to the future and not look backwards as much as we can uh, in our presentation today. A couple of topics we plan to cover is the impact uh, of COVID-19 on the tourism industry. As Gail said, it has left no industry untouched. We'll also kind of give you a tourism industry outlook kind of looking forward. And then also Nicole, uh, my coworker and team member, uh, director of convention center sales for the Renaissance Convention Center, a beautiful building that's just wrapping up its $216 million renovation. She's gonna kind of give us an update on uh, what business is looking like there, some of the changes they've made as they adapt to COVID protocols and what the bookings are look like. Because um, as we know, um, business travel is not exactly uh, fully resumed as we speak, but they are getting a lot of interest in some bookings. So we'll take a look at some of that. 
Um, again, my name is Kevin Kern with uh, Memphis Tourism PR. And uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't actually brag real quick on an accolade that our city and destination earned just yesterday. This is something that kind of been about six months in the making. Uh, Memphis was named to Times uh, World's Greatest Places list, a list of 100 cities around the globe, uh, joining Bangkok, Berlin, Seattle, and Santa Fe, and many others. Um, the only city in Tennessee to be named to this list. So that was uh, the result of one of our team members here at Memphis Tourism, Milton Howery, who had established a great relationship with the writer who put us forward. And, um, and here we are. So we're, we're very excited about that. And they actually talked about the uh, evolution of our destination uh, beyond Elvis, Blues, Elvis, and Barbecue, and some of the new hotel development, which uh, whether that's the restoration of uh, the train station, central station, or the new build with the, the Hyatt centric. So a lot going on. We're excited about that. Just wanted to bring that to everybody's attention. Uh, one of our primary responsibilities here at Memphis Tourism is uh, in, in PR and marketing is to showcase the value of uh, the local travel economy to our community. So that's one of these, why this opportunity is so great to talk to all of you um, that Tourism is a four billion, nearly four billion dollar industry. So if you look at the tourism economic impact, um, 3.65 billion in 2018, this is close to 3.8 in 2019. And of course, as we know, 2020 was a different year, but pre-pandemic, we were welcoming 12.4 million visitors a year to Memphis and Shelby County, about a million, million of those from outside North America, which is truly impressive. So uh, we hope to return to that as the borders open and we hope the borders reopen soon and get folks back to Memphis on airplanes. Um, but if you also look at the sales tax receipts generated by domestic visitor spending alone, uh, 101 million generated by domestic visitor spending to city taxes and 179 million and state sales tax receipts. So it's a big economic generator and a valuable part of our economy. Those dollars are earned elsewhere and then deposited, deposited into our local economy. Our primary objective here at Memphis Tourism is selling room nights. So we see all of the hotels, whether it's the well-known Peabody or the Holiday Inn around the corner. Uh, our organization is working hard to sell hotel room nights to visitors from around the world whether they're in town on business, here for a sports, um, sporting event, youth sports, professional sports, um, meetings and conventions, and of course, leisure visitor. Memphis is a very strong leisure market. Um, the month of April of 2020, um, we don't have to rewind the clock too far, but it was a very tough year, a tough month, and it was kind of the beginning um, uh, of what was a long trudge. 2019 was a record year for Memphis as a destination. We'd exceeded all previous records in terms of hotel demand. And in April, it declined by 90% uh, from April, uh, April of 2019. So it's a pretty significant decline, 100% decline in attraction visits. That's because everything from Graceland to Stax to the Rock and Soul Museum, the Civil Rights Museum were all closed. So, uh, and of course, most devastating, a 44% decline in employment for the hospitality industry. Uh, which is pretty devastating. Uh, although the good news from here on out is the rest of the slides should actually show some good news. Um, what we did after April was really kind of take a, take a step back and see what do we need to do. Uh, Memphis was, is always kind of weathered uh, storms such as 9-11, um, um, you know, volcanoes erupting in, in Europe and causing volcanic ash to prevent planes from crossing the pond. Um, we've tended to weather those storms better than most destinations. And certainly this was um, another instance of that because of our location. FedEx is here. Um, we're in a, within a day's drive of two thirds of the country. So we pivoted, um, power pivot is highly appropriate here. We pivoted to a 600 mile drive radius in our marketing efforts. We took a look at our data. We have a very intensive data program. Uh, looked at our markets that have a significant volume of Memphis visitors that also um, targeting them, those that have a fast average response time to marketing campaigns and a high share of overnight visitors. So who, is, who can we target with our marketing that is going to react quickly and book an overnight hotel room? We're not looking for day trippers. We're looking for people who are gonna book hotel rooms so we can get hotels full again. So the last year, year and a half has been the year and a half of the road trip uh, using our paid, earned, shared and owned media model um, paid is, you know, that purchased media, whether it's a pre-roll ad on Hulu or YouTube or a Facebook ad 
to earn media through things like the Time Magazine accolade to our shared media, such as memphistravel.com and all of our social channels. But really, it, we're a strong leisure market, and that is the only business that really was still percolating throughout the pandemic. Most businesses have still not returned to business travel. We expect that to pick back up in the third and fourth quarter, but right now it is still the year of the road trip with many families uh, hitting the road. This slide right here is probably gonna give you the best uh, encapsulation of where business um, stands, especially as we've kind of moved through uh, the, the major part of the pandemic and kind of gotten into a bit of a routine by January with vaccinations rolling out in March and April. Uh, but if you look at February, April, and May, uh, we had a pretty good uh, couple of months. And the, what we're also seeing here is a bit of a projection. So we actually worked with Tourism uh, Economics, an offshoot of Oxford Economics, to kind of give us a best and worst case scenario along with a middle of the road forecast. And so far, we have outpaced that middle of the road forecast. And if you look at the months of April and May, two of our most re recent months, you'll see that we captured 93% of our 2019 levels of hotel occupancy. So seven and 8% off of where we were in 2019 is pretty, pretty significant and outstanding. And as a whole, the Memphis market has really outpaced the national average by about 10%. So there are weekends um, in, in the spring and over the fall as well, where we actually outpaced um, coastal destinations like Tampa, Florida in terms of hotel occupancy um, overnight. So very impressive uh, and, a, and a good, um, you know, a good stat for our destination also proving that getting here by car is is an easy thing to do. Um, and hopefully we'll soon have an I-40 bridge to allow even more people to get here in a more timely fashion. Um, one of the things that's still hurting us and, and probably would put us back in that 2019 uh, level is the weekday occupancy. These, this is where we are missing our business travelers. So those folks that are coming in here to, to sell to FedEx and Medtronic and AutoZone and any of our companies that are looking to do business with out-of-town vendors that come into town, do a face-to-face -face meeting, take a Memphis client to dinner, um, that's who we're missing in the early parts of the week. And that's typically your Sunday to Wednesday business. So you can see in the downtown area specifically, Weekday occupancy was around 65% in 2019 during that time frame. It ticked up higher over the weekends with the leisure visitors coming in. But 2021's year to date so far, weekday occupancy downtown is just 30%. So we look forward to business travelers hitting the road once again, coming in town to sell, coming in town to do business and filling up um, our hotels throughout the week. But one of the last numbers I do want to leave you with is this one, 88%. Memphis and Shelby County has recovered 88% of our 2019 hotel level bookings um, so far for 2021 year to date. That's pretty good. Um, we are faring far better than some of our neighbors to the Northeast, South and West. So Memphis is sitting in a good position. Also one thing to keep in mind, we've added new hotel inventory um, since the start of the pandemic. You think about the Canopy downtown, a new build across the street from the Peabody. You look at the Hyatt Centric, um, we've got new hotels that have opened up and increased the number of available hotel rooms for bookings, um, which that is on the, uh, on the rise. We've got a lot of hotels in the pipeline. I know Ted will probably address that here in just a bit. But one of the things that we look forward to as well, just beyond the business bookings coming back is convention center bookings. Our uh, convention center is just wrapping up a multi-million dollar renovation. And to give us more on that, I'll toss it over to my coworker, Nicole Seltzer. Nicole, I think you're on mute. Sorry about that. Thank you, Kevin. Um, our story is just a little bit different um, because of the renovation and how COVID affected us. Um, there's never a time to shut a building down and do a renovation, but we picked a pretty good one, um, you know, uh, to, to be under renovation. And now we're, we're coming out of it and we're seeing that demand increase. Our last kind of, you know, COVID changed everything for everybody. Um, and it's hard to say what the new normal is going to be. Uh, but the best we can uh, compare ourselves to is what we had in 2018, which was before our renovation started in January of, of um, 2019. So most of my comparisons are going to be to 2018. 
in, in what we've done. Um, you can see here, Kevin's thrown in some pictures of, of my brand new beautiful building and we're just so pleased uh, to be able to show it off to everyone. Um, overall, um, we're still 300,000 square feet of convention space. Uh, we have 118,000 square foot column free exhibit hall, our 28,000 square foot ballroom and 46 breakout rooms. Um, a lot of what has changed, if, you, if anybody's been to the building before, is the old 1970s side of the building with low ceilings has been completely uh, redone. And we now have, you know, 20 foot ceilings in most of our meeting rooms. Um, but as you can see by this slide here, our booking pace, uh, based on kind of how we looked at our trajectory coming out of COVID, we are, um, have a lot more on the books than we had ever anticipated for 2021. And we're looking on pace to do our targets for 22, 23, and 24. Um, we tend to only book about three years out. We have a few very large events that we book further than three years out. Um, um, somewhere between five, five years is the most we ever uh, um, kind of book out that far. But um, um, you can see we're, we're looking good on that pace so far. So next slide, Kevin. Um, this shows our revenue pace and you can see this revenue again, we're, we're looking ahead for 21 and pacing very, very nicely for, for 22 through 24. I think we skipped one, Kevin, maybe. Oh, there we go, it got reversed, sorry. Um, so this is the one that shows the, the revenue um, for uh, 2021 pacing ahead for 22, 23 and 24. Um, you know, we've seen a big increase in our demand over the last few months. Um, you know, since the vaccines have been coming out, since everybody's getting more um, more comfortable with coming out and about, we ha have in house right now uh, the National Association of Free Will Baptists. A little over three thousand people in house for that event, thirty seven hundred room nights, and about a five million dollar economic impact for the city of Memphis. Um, and I think everybody saw in the news recently, we have AutoZone coming back in September. Um, they only made this decision about two weeks ago. So things are, things are changing very quickly as, as things get open up more um, and we're, we're looking forward to moving ahead. Um, we are about 75% um, to pace of our 2018 booking. So, and we're only halfway through the year. So I fully anticipate us getting back right back on track. I think that wraps it up for the tourism and the uh, Minnesota Convention Center. We're done. Okay. So we will now move to Ted Townsend for his presentation. Uh, Ted, we are we are ready for you whenever you are. All right. Thank you very much. I know Nathan is going to slide uh, load the first slide there in uh, in my deck. That's Definitely not it, but you're getting a sneak pre, uh, peek at uh, the information we're going to share. <laughs> All right, we'll start things over again. But I, I just want to thank everyone, and, and especially uh, our great economic development partner, MLGW, for this opportunity to discuss where things are with the market. I think you'll uh, be interested to see that we've seen a lot of recovery and rebound uh, since a year ago a little over a year ago now. Uh, in fact, we've recaptured almost 78% of the job loss that was uh, experienced in between the, the month of March and April last year. Now, mind you, uh, what's important to note is that dating back to the recession in 2008-09, it took Memphis about 10 years uh, to recapture uh, the peak job growth at that time. And uh, over the last five-year period from 2014 to 2019, when last measured, 
Uh, Memphis and, and Shelby County had recaptured almost 1.4% uh, in terms of job growth, bulk of that occurring in 18 and 19. So we were uh, seeing this wave of momentum. It was still lagging behind uh, the national average as well as other uh, key markets in the U.S., but we were thankful for that growth, and, um, and we didn't get to enjoy it very long, unfortunately. And so you had the precipitous drop of, of 73,000 uh, plus jobs in a month span. So that means we lost all of that recapturing of job growth uh, that took 10 years, we lost in one month. Um, so we don't have to sit here and lament and, and feel the, the pain of what that caused. We just saw it in, in the, uh, uh, the hospitality industry and, and its impact. Um, but today, I'm, I'm here to talk about the promise of, of a greater Memphis future. And, uh, and we've, we've got some information here that we're going to share with you that I think is really going to be interesting and probably bring into perspective a bit, at least that's my hope, that, that there is uh, a lot of growth and potential um, coming up along the way. So in the next slide, um, I just wanted to give you a sense of our project headlines and, and what they mean right now. So uh, we determine projects as those that are business attraction or helping existing businesses in the greater Memphis region expand. That means they're investing in their operation. That could be a new capital equipment piece. And, and certainly what we hope is that they're investing in their workforce and creating new exciting jobs for, uh, for Memphians. So uh, what you see here is our, our headlines. This is just a, a half year snapshot of what we've seen thus far, 18 projects that we have announced in partnership with MLGW and others. And it represents a, a total capital investment of almost a billion dollars. And, and what that means is it's real and personal property, uh, the built environment, and then maybe equipment, software, things like that. It also represents the, the promise of 2,271 new jobs to our local economy. Uh, those aren't jobs right now. Uh, they're coming on board at different paces based on the, the company and, and their onboarding, but those are going to be great jobs for, for Memphians moving forward. And you see the average estimated wage that uh, those jobs represent at $47,000. And I thought it would be interesting just to share some perspective year over year about where we stand with those 18 deals. You see a year ago, it's really hard to measure a pandemic year, but we were very pleased uh, with the fact that we had seven projects already announced at this time last year, representing over 1,400 jobs. And then you see 19 and 18 respectively. But what, what that really tells you is that things are opening back up. Companies are investing capital and jobs are getting created. And our goal is to make sure that every one of those jobs that's being committed to, that's enumerated here on the screen, is filled with uh, some of our citizenry. So that's, that's the big focus. And, and I think that's an encouraging note. So the next slide is going to share with you a little information about where we stand with our current pipeline, meaning the uh, opportunities that stand before us um, in our project pipeline. So currently we have 72 projects under management right now, and those represent almost 21,000 jobs. And yes, those figures are correct on the screen, almost $9.5 billion in capital investment. And then if you look at the average wages, they're much higher, $57,000. Uh, so we have a robust pipeline, and we're really excited to have these opportunities to present Memphis to these companies, both existing and those that aren't here, but are considering Memphis as the home for their location in the future. And really, it's a numbers game. Uh, so we have to focus on being highly competitive, uh, partnering together, and, and closing on these deals. So the next slide, I wanted to share with you just a breakdown of what this pipeline means. 72 projects, okay. Well, what, what kinds of companies are looking at us? So again, uh, this shows you that almost 64% of these projects are represented by manufacturing operations. Memphis is known for our transportation distribution and logistics. That, that is not a shock to anyone here. Um, and what I like is the fact that not only can we get any product anywhere in the world overnight, 
no matter if it's via FedEx or, or one of our other modal uh, uh, transportation logistics infrastructure partners, we can get the product there. What I'm hopeful for is that we will make more products here in greater Memphis. So that's encouraging. And I, I think I'll, I'll also point out uh, the, the slice of the pie there that says corporate and professional offices. We've seen a tremendous increase in that reaching now over 15% of our pipeline. Uh, these are a mixture of headquarters and shared services and tech centers that are now considering Memphis for, for their investment. So uh, again, I'm, I'm really thrilled with that. And the manufacturing and the corporate, that's also what's driving up the average wages as well. So the next slide is going to simply share with you uh, something that I'm most uh, excited about is that attraction. So if you think from uh, the hospitality and, and tourism uh, realm, you know, we're looking for uh, new visitors here. We're trying to attract new visitors and certainly hotel nights. Um, we're also trying to attract new business here. We, we love to support the businesses that are already here. We want them to double down and continue their investment and growth in Memphis. Uh, but we also understand the importance of introducing new industries to our market. So you see 70 six percent are business attraction opportunities uh, with existing and miscellaneous rounding out the balance of that pie and that's important because we we need these kinds of companies that are considering us um, perhaps for the first time and so uh, i've never seen economic development activity this robust before uh, i've been doing this for about 10 years and um, and it, we're busier than we've ever been and uh, I know my partners at MLGW can, uh, can echo that sentiment. Uh, so how do we get there? What do we focus on at the Greater Memphis Chamber and, and the partnership with the University of Memphis? Well, the next slide will tell you the, the industry clusters, opportunity clusters, that we, as we like to call them, where we're going to hone in the, the messaging and the assets of Memphis in a new and a unique way. So you obviously see agribusiness and food. Our location is unquestionable. Uh, very strategic to these types of businesses. And uh, obviously uh, sitting on top of 57 trillion gallons of very clean and abundant water helps with these kinds of processes. And if you're a company in California, let me tell you right now, you're looking at the greater Memphis area because of the abundance and quality of our water. So we see that as an industry sector that's going to continue to grow. Medical device and healthcare technology Obviously, we are uh, very strong in that indus industry cluster. We are the second largest market in the U.S. Uh, for medical device manufacturing. We want to be number one, obviously. So we're going to do everything we can to continue to grow that transportation, log uh, logistics, and distribution with FedEx uh, headquartered here and uh, a big footprint from Amazon now. You're talking about two of the largest logistics companies and tech companies in the world that have a significant presence in, in Memphis. So we are excited about logistics tech and where that's going to take our economy. Music and digital technology, obviously tying back to our deep heritage in, in all manners of music. Uh, it's, it's amazing and we're excited about building out that cluster. Emerging technology and innovation, uh, an example of that is electric vehicles. Uh, we want to uh, build electric vehicles, and I know that MLGW will be thrilled with that uh, because that requires a lot of power. And so we're going to be pivoting every day, I uh, worked it in, uh, to powering up uh, this sector of industry. Uh, business and corporate operations and headquarters, we're whale hunting. We want big headquarters to, to locate in our city. And then capital intensive manufacturing, obviously. Uh, that's, that's important because particularly for the small business community here, looking at all of this activity that I shared with you today, these are investments that will go into our local economy. They're going to provide opportunities for small businesses to plug into that spend. And programs like Buy Memphis at the Greater Memphis Chamber are helping to amplify and provide those connection points to our small businesses here so that they can partner with these larger companies that, that are considering us. And um, I know that um, we, we talked a little bit about uh, the, the projects underway. You know, Memphis is looking at 19 billion in, in capital investments, uh, either planned or underway, tremendous amount of projects. Uh, the Memphis Business Journal had a pipeline report yesterday 
uh, July 20th, uh, that show numbers from Pinkowski and Company. And there are 47 properties consisting of more than 6,200 new hotel rooms in the Memphis hotel market. And that's a pipeline that's fa uh, forecasting out to 2025. Um, you know, there's no guarantee that all of those projects will come to fruition, uh, but we're excited about the, just the opportunity that these are planned and, and hopefully will we'll get underway. Um, so uh, in terms of areas, you know, downtown Memphis is, is listed as having the most proposed hotel projects with 14 properties and over almost 2,700 rooms uh, that are planned and, and hopefully will be programmed. And uh, Kevin and Nicole will fill up all of those rooms and we'll do what we can as well at the Greater Memphis Chamber. And that's uh, downtown is uh, closely followed by East Memphis with seven properties and 685 rooms. And then obviously the South Haven area is third uh, with this mix of, of properties at six planned uh, developments with 536 rooms. So again, you know, the things like uh, what we received, the accolade yesterday from Time Magazine, um, if you think I'm not weaponizing that into the narrative of why not Memphis, uh, you'd be crazy. I was thrilled to see that. I was thrilled to see that Memphis is um, among, as it should be, the top 100 destinations around the planet uh, for folks to visit. And, um, and so that translates really well with the C-suite of companies that we're hoping to attract. And, uh, and so just take heart. I know things are challenging and we're still sh shouldering into a lot of uncertainty. Um, but if these numbers are Indian, any indicator, uh, know that Greater Memphis is very active and we hope to close on these opportunities to, to great, create new pathways for folks, um, both from tourism and from, um, from the, the business and private sector. With that, I will uh, close my remarks and we'll move on with questions. Thank you, Gail. You all provided some, I mean, some awesome information on the Memphis number of um, projects that you all are working on, the average uh, income that will be coming with the jobs that you're talking about, uh, which is above the average income that we have here. So I would like to start with Kevin and Nicole, and could you please tell us how you all are being competitive in bringing events and businesses here and to the convention center? How, how are you being competitive with other cities? You know, I can, I can take a quick stab at that. I mean, you know, Memphis has not been competitive in the past. Um, our facility has been severely lacking um, and, you know, we have solved the facility problem. And next up is the hotel problem. So um, we've got to have more hotels. That's why the Lowe's project is so critical the future Grand Hyatt and what's happening and already taking shape and taking shape at one Beale, more full service hotels with suites are key. Um, but, you know, there are other incentives that um, bring people in, whether, you know, it, it's room nights or whether it's free Wi-Fi, other variety of things that are in the toolkit to incentivize folks to come back. And of course, one of the biggest uh, pieces of the, of the pie that we were able to re-secure and bring back to Memphis was the Church of God in Christ. Um, yeah, I was about to ask you about that. <laughs> so, and I know that was a question in the, in the chat earlier as well. So Kojic is coming back. We're thrilled about that. And I know that's going to keep Nicole and the team busy as well in the fall. But they've been in town doing some uh, site visits and pre-cons, and they're extremely thrilled uh, with the renovation of the facility, as are all the meeting planners that are moving through the building these days. So Nicole, so number one, will you all have enough space for all that Kojic is going to need and also Kevin and Nicole and, and, and possibly Ted, in the past, we did not have enough rooms in Memphis. Uh, many of the COVID um, visitors had to go to South Haven and other locations outside of the Memphis area uh, just for sleeping. So how are we gonna handle that in, in hopes to keep them here? Because they haven't been here in five years now. Well, we, I'll speak to that so a little bit. Gail, we um, we do have Kojic actually secured for the next three years. Um, they have committed awesome. to coming. Awesome. So yes, so that's so that's great. So we've got a little bit of uh, a room to grow there. Um, from a standpoint of all of their space, not everything will be here in the building. Um, they are using some remote locations, and 
that's changing a little bit for this year's event, just based on COVID and some precautions that they're taping, taking. Um, they were going to use FedEx Forum, but I think they've decided that this year they're just going to stick with the convention center and some of the local churches for for their um, for their events. Um, and then I think in the future that will that will come back into play where they'll they'll also use the forum and the other local churches. As far as hotel rooms. Um, we need that Lowe's Hotel, uh, as Kevin mentioned. Um, I think having the the, the Hyatt hotels um, online and and the other hotels that we've been, that we've brought online over the last year or so are certainly going to help us um, meet that goal of the room nights for Kojic. But there still will be some. Kojic is a very very large convention for. It is. <laughs> Yeah, and, and all, a lot of business here in Memphis for many, many years. And I'll echo on that, um, just so everybody's aware, you know, Kojic is what we call a citywide event. And mm -hmm. typically it does take hotels across the city and county. And in our case, across state lines to accommodate this, you know, you might liken this to an NCAA tournament that brings in multiple thousands of people. And, you know, there are only so many hotel rooms downtown to be had. Um, but 2000 more in the pipeline is certainly going to allow more folks to stay downtown, but it truly is a citywide event. I, you know, honestly, I think we should just get several copies of that Time magazine and, <laughs> and Kevin and Nicole can autograph it and we just send it to every CEO of every hotel uh, conglomerate in the U.S. And, and beyond, so. Let's do it. Let's do that. That's a power pivot. Yeah, that's that's flex. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I, I do want us to address one other concern that, that, that's arising now quickly in this country and around the world, the Delta variant. We've made some, you all have mentioned some progress that we've made. We're turning the corner here in Memphis and Shelby County as far as being able to meet some, some, some new visitors and some growth and new jobs and businesses. How will this new variant the Delta variant impact our progress because it's supposed to be more deadly, uh, growing quicker. Uh, will we be shut down again? I mean, how will this impact us if it is as, I mean, the numbers continue to grow with the projections that we are hearing, how will, how, how will this impact us? You know, I'll, I'll, I'll go first. I'll just say, I, I wish I had a crystal ball. It is hard to predict. I mean, it, you know, I think we can sort of start to see folks starting to remask voluntarily. I've started to do that some myself. I've seen other people do it. Um, I think, you know, we need to have a growing call to, to get vaccines into the arms of folks. And so we can avoid some of the measures that took place sooner. I mean, shutting down the entire economy is, is, uh, is a challenge for, for everyone watching this and, um, and not watching this. So I think if we can all do our own part um, and, and get vaccinated and encourage our friends and family to get vaccinated, um, you know, I, I've had the vaccine since March and, uh, I, you know, nothing's happened to me. So, um, I, I, you know, it, it is one of those things that I think, get the vaccine, please. And if you've had it, be an advocate for it. Um, you know, let's not get into political debate, um, but, you know, we all put on seatbelts because it's recommended. We've all taken the flu vaccine in the past because it's recommended. Um, this is another recommend, recommendation that could potentially save your life. The Delta variant has the chance of beating the, the vaccine five to 10%. So your odds are better with it than without it. And, and in addition to uh, saving lives, it also can help save jobs. Uh, bring our economy back. I mean, we were hit so hard with the COVID and I mean, so many jobs. We mentioned, we talked about all the job lost and how it impacted. Mm -hmm. Do, some of the jobs that we lost, will they come back? In the tourist and in tourism industry and in, in the entertainment, will they come back you all? Because some of the things I'm reading saying some of these jobs won't come back. Ted? <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I, I'll let the, the, the experts uh, speak to the, the uh, tourism industry, but, you know, we can't afford to go through what we experienced in just the, that month time frame that I talked about, losing 73,000 jobs. You know, I think we've seen some displacement of, of those um, workers into new jobs uh, and new fields uh, for themselves. 
uh, which is, you know, still has a residual effect from my understanding in the tourism industry. But um, the fact is that there's high demand. People are wanting to e experience travel. Uh, and in particular, they're wanting from the numbers to experience the, the type of experience that we can offer them here in Memphis. So we need to do everything we can to, um, and, and Kevin said it so beautifully, I, I couldn't say it any better than that, encourage, advocate, and, and we can't afford, our economy can't afford to have another uh, stumble with the, the variant uh, having an impact on, on the human condition here. Um, you know, it took us 10 years to recover from a recession. Uh, we, you know, we, we had a little bit of growth, uh, then that loss, and we recaptured some, but, you know, we got we to gotta stay vigilant. And as for the jobs in this particular sector of tourism and hospitality, um, you know, the biggest problem right now is not having enough workers to fill available positions, at least locally. There are a lot of hotels that have, are holding back inventory that are non-revenue rooms that they could theoretically sell and potentially sell out, but they don't have enough employees to um, accommodate all of those, those uh, potential visitors that are coming in. So that is perhaps the biggest challenge, but we certainly don't want to experience another shutdown. You know, hotels um, have faced the challenge, but I think what we would probably find uh, if we went back to something like that is that we would have some of our favorite local restaurants may not make it a second time. So hopefully we can all do our part um, to continue to support our local restaurants and, and do our part and get a vaccine and be an advocate for it. So Cole, uh, regarding the, the, uh, the convention center, um, you all were already going through remodeling and rebuilding and stuff. Did you all lose a lot of employees? We did not. Um, we were we were fortunate in those regards that right before the renovation began, we had you know we knew we were going to be slowed down, um, and um, we offered a, a package to some of our long term employees that were close to retirement and were able to slim ourselves down um, pretty good before the renovation started. So when we went into the pandemic, um, we really only had a core staff. Um, of employees. And so coming out of the pandemic, it has been challenging. Um, we, you know, we opened back up in, in January tentatively for um, volleyball events. And um, I was cleaning bathrooms along with, <laughs> along with everybody else. So it's, um, you know, it's, it, it, as Kevin had said, uh, finding the staffing to, um, to pull off the events is what is the challenge. You know, we're, we're in the hospitality industry. So, you know, service is what we are, service is what we do and, and how you do that is by your employees. So, you know, when it comes to that aspect of the hospitality industry, those jobs will definitely come back once we're out of the woods, so to speak. Okay, so but how, how, do we encourage, how are we going to encourage people to come back to these jobs? You know, we are, hold, oh, Kevin looks like he was going to say something on that. It, it, it is um, to an extent, you know, the state, state of Tennessee um, Department of Labor, as well as Tennessee Tourism, because this is a challenge we're facing across the state, has launched a campaign in, you know, encouraging people to think about a career in tourism and hospitality. Uh, we, we call them jobs, but we hope that folks will find a career in tourism and hospitality and stay for a while. On the opposite side of the coin, you look at um, private employers such as the Peabody and, and other hotels that are offering bonuses, sign-on bonuses to incentivize people to uh, take a job there. And it, and it is a, it, it is the job applicants market at this point. There, there are tons of jobs out there. Um, I've seen signs about $15 an hour. Um, there are other jobs that start out higher than that. So it is, um, it is uh, you know, the applicant's choice at this point um, and getting them back in the workforce. It, it, is, it is a challenge and there is still some hesitancy, uh, but certainly wages and sign-on bonuses is going to be a tremendous incentive for someone to, to take a job if they're looking for one. Well, I was watching the national news, I guess a couple of weeks ago, one of the stories that stayed with me was come September, uh, the job market is gonna be very, very, very competitive. Uh, that, uh, and I was reading even before the show, 
uh, some people who were trying to get into jobs and applying for the jobs and not being called back. So hopefully uh, each month that goes by, we will have more and more uh, people, you know, wanting to come back into uh, these jobs. But what we'll do now is we'll move into some of the questions I ha we've received. One is what impact did Memphis and May have on our economy this year uh, with less attendance? Uh, I'll take a stab at that question. Um, you know, Memphis and May does their own independent um, economic impact report. Mm -hmm. And this year is a little bit trickier with the scaled back event, No Beale Street Music Festival. So it, it, it's definitely been an off year. It's it still helped boost the month of May. If you looked at hotel occupancy the week of the barbecue fest, um, hotels were busy. Certainly the Hyatt centric there at the, at the <clears throat> entrance to the park. But Memphis in May is always a, a strong generator of, of revenue and room nights for the tourism and hospitality industry um, in Memphis and Shelby County. And uh, it is something that, you know, with, with it taking place elsewhere outside the downtown area where that infrastructure exists will be a challenge, but it will be back as um, <clears throat> the park gets under construction. So definitely a tremendous impact to our community and, um, and, and we hope Memphis May lasts forever and, and comes back even stronger after the pandemic. Uh, does anyone else want to uh, comment on that question? Okay, so another question we have, and, and Ted, you kind of touched on this. Has there been any growth in the medical industry in Memphis and Shelby County? Yeah, and I can, I can speak to the medical device specifically, um, and which would be separate, obviously, from you know, the healthcare delivery uh, perspective. I don't have the numbers on those, but, but we've seen an uptick in, in job growth for, in particular, the, the medical device and life science industries here. Uh, so that's encouraging. Um, obviously, you've had some companies that have announced really major expansions like um, Cognate Biosciences, who was acquired by Charles River, a very large uh, life science biotech uh, firm and, and headquartered in Boston. Uh, so they're, they're increasing their footprint here, and we were su successful in uh, being able to recruit Alpha Tech, uh, which is a San Diego-based medical device company uh, here. So they'll be opening their operation next week, in fact. So we're, we're seeing some right. incremental growth there. Yeah. How many jobs will they be bringing? The ones you said uh, we'll next week? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're going to be scaling, uh, obviously, but their, their total commitment is, is uh, at 100. Uh, it'll grow to 100. So it'll, it'll be a nice little operation here for us. Every job counts. Everyone. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Nicole, what is the new size of the convention center? So the, the size is still pretty much the same. It's 300,000 square feet of, oh, wow. of space um, total. What, what has changed is the configuration of the space and the usability of the space. Um, there was a lot of space that was unusable um, because you couldn't get to it without going through another room and the way it was designed um, originally. And that all has been corrected. Uh, another thing that we did was we took what, what used to be the old South Hall here in the convention center, which um, was a 35,000 square foot, basically exhibit hall, which was built for the Wonder Series, if anybody remembers the Wonder Series when it was here. I remember, um, that. I remember that under the former mayor. Right, and we repurposed that space uh, to be an 18,000 square foot junior ballroom and an additional 10 breakout rooms. So we increased our number of breakout rooms and much have it be a much more usable space. We probably only used it half a dozen times a year uh, previously because it's it wasn't really a finished space in the convention center and now it's it's uh, you know I hate I hate to use the word hotel quality finishes but um, because convention centers should be up to that standard as well but we we really do have very high-end finishes throughout the building that's wonderful that's wonderful how many hotel rooms are available um, for our convention do we have a total number, Kevin or Nicole? I believe we have over 30,000 citywide in Shelby County. Uh -huh. And then downtown specifically is close to 2,500. 
with about another 2000 on the way. So you can actually see almost a doubling of the downtown hotel inventory uh, with what's in the pipeline, which is significant. So, you know, the more full service hotels we have, um, the, the more conventions we'll be able to get. Um, you know, limited service hotels that don't offer room service that don't have dry cleaning, you know, you don't have to have a spa, but it's certainly helpful. You know, your, your full service hotels are truly what meeting planners want to have a room block in. And uh, the more hotels we have, the more room blocks that become available to meeting planners to, to put 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 people um, when we look at these larger conventions coming to the city. Okay. So are there events that will require vaccines in the Cannon Center and the Convention Center? So the, the Convention Center and the Cannon Center itself um, as, as a building is not requiring that. However, the events and the event planners themselves may require it. Um, okay. For instance- What about the social distancing? Um, we are following all um, Shelby County Health Department directives and, you know, uh, CDC guidelines as far as that goes um, with, with social distancing. We also have our GBAC certification, um, which is a sanitization um, certification through the industry, um, which indicates that we routinely uh, sanitize high touch points. We spray the rooms every night after the events and things like that. So there's a pretty strict protocols that we have to follow to remain uh, GBAC certified. So we do have that and are following that. Um, but like I said, we, we tend to let the meeting planner themselves okay. set the guidelines for their events. I know the AutoZone event coming up, I believe is requiring a vaccine for their, for their attend if their people are going to attend. Oh, okay. That's good to know. So we have one more question and Ted, that's for you. How is the chamber facing the workforce shortage? Yeah, so, so I would answer that saying very proactively because we, we uh, strive to be the voice of the business community and we work very closely with employers to ensure that our region offers effective training programs that are specialized to what their needs are and, and their demand. Um, and obviously focusing on a strong educational system to prepare a strong pipeline of, of talent for those companies. So, you know, we support strong educational programs from pre-K um, through college and technical training. And in fact, uh, we've partnered with Shelby County Schools on their CCTE that stands for College, Career, and Technical Education. Um, that's going to help connect these students uh, in, in our area schools to future career opportunities with these exciting employers. Um, but, you know, I think also it's just mapping the resources, understanding where the partners are in the ecosystem, and then allowing for those connection points between those providers, the resources, and then the jobs that are available so that we can position people uh, with the right skills to succeed. Uh, we've got a jobs board. We have a section for employer resources. If there are companies on the line looking uh, for ways in which they can tap into it, we have a resume bank. We also focus on young professionals and we've got a council that helps to uh, provide mentorship and, and training opportunities for young professionals in the greater Memphis market. So there's a lot of work to be done, Gail. Um, we uh, by no means have been able to fully address the workforce shortage. It's going to persist uh, for the time being, but uh, the way you break through that is just to continue to remain active. You ver stay very close with these employers. You understand where their job openings are now, uh, what pitfalls or uh, uh, you know obstacles are out there uh, for them to be able to fulfill those jobs. And then you have to start mapping and working through the, the, the available workforce, uh, folks that are underemployed or unemployed, and making sure they have access to the training opportunities so that it directly connects to these companies. You know, Tennessee still is one of very few states in our nation that allows for uh, both graduating high school seniors and adults to go back to college um, with last dollar scholarships through Tennessee Promise and Reconnect programs. It's a tremendous asset, and, and I'm hoping that uh, if folks are struggling to find that opportunity or employers are struggling to find that right 
person to fill that, that position, um, that they seek us out as well as our other partners in the market to, to make sure that we bridge those gaps. Well, thank you, Chancellor Rivers. Those are some good questions to answer there. Um, Nicole, do you have any closing comments for our guests, for our viewers? Can you hear me? Any closing comments for our viewers, Kevin and Nicole? I don't necessarily. I just thank you for, for letting us share what's going on. We're looking forward to um, what com we're, you know, cautiously optimistic about um, what's how we can move forward with this. It's, it's great to see the building full um, right now and, and here there's a, a service going on right now in the exhibit hall so I can hear the music coming through the walls um, up in my office and it's, it's great. And I'll just echo that sentiment and share if you see folks wandering around the town, run, wandering around town looking like they need directions, offer them help, know that we're a, a global destination that attracts people from around the world. Um, if you haven't gotten your vaccine, think about getting one, do your research. And if you know anybody looking for a job, uh, tell them that there are plenty of jobs available in tourism and hospitality. It'd be a great career. Those were some very good closing remarks. We greatly appreciate you being on the show today and providing such wealth of information for our viewers. And I want to thank our economic and community development staff, Cynthia and Terica, and some of the Corpcom folks, Erica, No Corden, and uh, Tamara and her team, and always our IT team, Nathan Smith and Darren, uh, who's, who are just amazing and make sure that we can do all of these great and wonderful informative shows. So uh, we'll see you all next month for Power Pivot. Thank you for watching.